no, 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 no. You know, you know. That's a writer's job is to voice things that people can't say. Nobody says anything unless they want something. He says, what, what brought you to Casablanca? And Bogart says, the waters. And <laughs> Claude Rain says, it's a desert. And Bogart says something like, I was mistaken. I was misinformed. I was misinformed. <laughs> Which is great dialogue. Just great dialogue. Music. It's music. You know, which is the difference between speak, speak like we're doing here and an and, interesting dialogue. An interesting dialogue. First thing you have to understand about dialogue is that it's got to be connected to the character's desire line in the scene. In other words, it, if a character has an objective, an intention in the scene, the dialogue has to match that intention. And what I see a lot of times, especially with exposition and information, is that a character is saying all that information and you can tell that it's really the writer's objective. In other words, the writer wants, to, wants the audience to know this information because they think, okay, the audience needs to know this and this and this and this, so the character is going to say this and this and this and this. And that doesn't work because scenes and dialogue are about a character's intention in the scene. Everything a character says is matched to what that desire line is. To know your character's goals and their wants uh, in general and then also in that particular scene. So then that will inform how they speak. You know, if they, if they want this out of that other character, they would talk in this way, you know, because they're trying to maybe sway the other character. Ideally, the audience is in on that too. It knows their wants. That was something that David Mamet always said. He said the only thing an actor needs to know is what they want in the scene, and ideally the audience knows that too. When you reread the dialogue, ask yourself for every line, why is that character saying this? Why is that character saying that specific line? Most of the time it will be because they're responding to what, so they're reacting to something, that's fine. But a lot of the times you will find that a character is saying something because you want the character to say that, not because the character wants something in that scene at that specific time. So you got to know what the character wants and then every line of dialogue is a strategy for that character to get what they want. And if that dialogue is not that, then you rewrite the line until it fits that. What are they trying to achieve in that scene? What's in the way? and sort of what are they doing to try to get through whatever's in the way. That's pretty much the template for pretty much every scene. So then it's like, okay, part of that is gonna be dialogue. Part of that is gonna be what they say. And what they say should be the, the things that they would believably say given who they are and what their unique voice and way of speaking is in that situation given what's going on and what they want. When you go to say something, there's probably a hundred different ways you could think of to say it. Why are you choosing the particular way you, you choose? And when you start to think like that um, and why your character is choosing to say something that way and what they really don't want to reveal, like why, why will they go to this length but they won't go just a little bit more vulnerable? When you kind of understand that about your character, then I think writing the dialogue becomes easier. But you have to put that thought process into it first to know what they want to conceal and what they want to, to give. In an ideal world, it's more often than not, it's subtextual. So that what's being communicated is really more about what's underneath the words than the words themselves. It's also, dialogue is also the words that aren't spoken. Sometimes the best dialogue is what's not said. People also don't always just express everything they want, right? The best dialogue has subtext, which means the audience can pick up that they're thinking and feeling something that they're not saying, but what they're saying is what they think is the right thing to say to try to like get whatever it is that they want or the, the only thing that they're sort of able to say for whatever reason, given who they are and what's going on. But it's helpful if there's this sense of subtext of we know what the inner life is underneath that, that they're not saying. I think it's more useful to think of subtext as the underlying verb. What am I doing? What am I doing in the scene? An actor is asked, what am I doing? And dialogue is action with words. That's all it is. It's somebody doing something, but they're using words instead of actions, physical actions. 
And so it's a useful thing when you have a scene that's already written to just see whether you can reduce each line of dialogue to a verb. And the kind of verbs you're looking for are things like attack, defend, deflect, um, persuade, seduce. Those are the kinds of verbs you want the, the lines to have. Okay? You don't want explain. <laughs> it's just emotionally neutral. And that's where the Q&A thing comes in. So uh, if you have the dialogue, how are you today? And the person says, well, I didn't sleep much last night. That's Q&A. But if you have a character who says, you look like hell. And they say, well, I didn't sleep much last night. You see, now you've got attack defense. Hey, I didn't sleep much. So you transform it into something that actually moves, that, that actually is uh, dynamic, and we're following action. Each scene is pushing your story forward. So that means each scene has a goal, like a little mini goal of the larger goal. If you don't know what that is, you can get lost in the sauce of your dialogue and your action, right? If you're writing features, um, features are pushed more by action than dialogue. That doesn't mean that I need to literally see more lines of action, but it may mean that there are more opportunities to remove dialogue because action can tell me um, what it is that they could have said. So like I said before, how can you show me that you're angry without telling me that you're angry, right? So instead of cursing mom out, I'm going to slam the door and walk out, right? So now you got a line of action instead of dialogue. What I call Q&A dialogue. How are you today? Okay. How about you? Well, not bad. I think I'll go to the store. What about you? Well, I think I'll not go to the store. You know, what, that's that's Q&A dialogue. A lot of times the people are sitting and talking, right? So you're in a room, you're in a house or whatever, and so they're sitting and talking. But I think making sure that that pacing is good um, so it just doesn't feel like really, you know, people just explaining things. That's kind of the death of people's dialogue is when people over explain and they don't know how to sort of weave in that, that exposition kind of nicely. Um, then it really just kind of like hangs there. That's, that's not good writing. On the nose dialogue is dialogue that is generic. It is describing something that we could easily see that is clear in the scene. It's explaining something. Um, it's just kind of like lazy dialogue that doesn't uh, show that character's voice. On the nose dialogue usually means your characters are saying everything that they're thinking. There is no nuance. There is no subtext. Let's say you have two lovers and they're at a table and it's beautiful and, you know, the candle lit and one says to the other, darling, I love you, I love you, I love you. And he says, well, that's not actable because it's, it's too on the nose. This is what on the nose dialogue. The only thing about drama in any form is what actions are playable, what, and they're not playable. So what I've learned in the course of my writing life and of watching other people's work is, is crying, the, the woman cries. That's not a playable, you have to be more descriptive about it. What is she doing when she's crying? And that, the actor's always gonna find something else to do, something better, but you gotta give them a hint. They have talk but no dialogue. Talk, spe human speech can be poetic, it can be witty, uh, clever, poet uh, 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 moving, but it isn't dialogue unless there's, there's action under it. It's conversation with a purpose. It's, it's people conversing, but every line needs to move the story forward in some respect. Whether it's moving the plot forward through some sort of revelation that a character makes, or moves these characters forward in their own relationship because they have an argument and that conflict causes one or both of them or more of them to shift in terms of their thought processes and feelings. Or it provides some exposition, some information, some data, which is a key to help them get a clue to move the thing forward. But yeah, dialogue is conversation, but it's conversation with a purpose. You need to be really mindful of that. The other thing to keep in mind about a screenplay as opposed to a novel is it's a limited amount of time, so it has to be richer. Every, they say a novel is drama, a novel is gossip, 
Drama is scandal. You know, everybody is, instead of walking, you're running. So if you have dialogue, it's precious and you want it to be rich. In uh, Pulp Fiction, there's a moment where Bruce Willis' character goes to buy some cigarettes and he says to the bartender, he says, one pack of red apples. And the bartender says, filters? And he says, none. <laughs> and that's just a really cool, fast, interesting exchange there, as opposed to five lines to explain what brand of cigarettes he wants. And, oh, you know what? How about no filters in those cigarettes, you know? Because it's very noirish feel. It's very, um, you know, clipped and dark and tight. And it's just filters, none. And that just gets the, the idea across. My issue is I write too much dialogue. Like my first film was like, they just said, look, man, this is a 10 page scene and they're just talking. <laughs> And I'm like, well, I don't know how to cut it because I love everything they're saying. <laughs> and I'm like, that's what they say. He's like, well, we can cut it now. We can cut it in the editing room. The problem I see is when it's too long. You know, then we're kind of wondering, okay, where's, where's the conflict? Where's what's happening here? I mean, it might be interesting, but, but you know, even something that's really interesting for too long will d disengage an audience after a while. So don't, you could do it, just don't do it for too long. Especially for new writers, you don't want to have super, super long dialogue blocks and too many monologues. Um, just saw Oppenheimer and Christopher Nolan has a lot of expositional and explanatory dialogue, but it makes sense because they're all scientists and they're going back and forth about all of these scientific topics and they're just giving detail after detail. Um, and it's, you, you, are okay with it more because visually he's a stunning director, you know. Um, the big screen experience is important to him and I saw it in a the theater and it is interesting to watch. But on the page, I'm guessing there's just, it would just be so much long, long, long dialogue, on the nose dialogue scenes with so much exposition and I'd be like, oh my God, when are they gonna stop talking about fission versus fusion, you know. So a newer writer who doesn't have that track record who isn't known for something like Aaron Sorkin might be known for monologues, but you're not. So you really want to um, keep the dialogue as tight as possible. Maybe with uh, you know, a few flourishes every now and then, maybe you do have a key uh, monologue um, once or twice in your script that uh, ideally it captures theme, it explores the theme, what your story's about. Read your dialogue aloud. Yes, very good point. And, I don't do you it, can, but I you can start. It you can start saying, "Well, that that's not <laughs> coming off my tongue very easily." Uh, I don't think I want to ask somebody to say that. You know, when composers compose, and you're writing for an orchestra, and you don't know how to play the French horn, and you can't play the oboe, and quite often after it's done, you have people play through the parts, and they say, "That's unplayable. You can't finger it that way," and they have to go back and they have to change their parts because they're not writing for that instrument. I had a, an absolute crash course in writing dialogue. Years ago, I, I used to write with Charlie Sheen. Um, I don't care if they don't credit him in the sitcoms he's been in as a writer. I know who's been writing the dialogue. I worked with him for three years. I, I never read or heard better dialogue from anybody than that came from him that he wrote. Um, and I asked him one day, uh, I used to be really good at writing scene direction. My dialogue was flat. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't engaging. It wasn't edge of your seat. And I asked him one day when we were writing, um, the way we worked is we'd set it up and I would write the scene direction and he would do the dialogue unless, you know, it was some basic stuff. It was easy. And I finally said to him, I said, where do you get this encyclopedia of incredible dialogue? I, I've never heard anybody with it before. And he said, you just listen. He said, you know, when this was working, these aren't working. And if these aren't working, you can't absorb what's happening and how people interact and find those gems. He said, most, most of the things that I write that people like, I heard at a party, I heard at a barbecue, I heard at an airport, I heard while I was pumping gas. He said, you know, I'll get out and pump gas and I'll hear a couple bickering in the car next to me at the pump. And he said, that's gold. He goes, that is gold, man. He said, you know, and this is before everybody had phones, so we, were, we weren't listening to them, we were doing this. So I find the best, the best advice to writing good dialogue is listen. In listening to how real people talk, it doesn't mean you're transcribing it exactly, you know. People don't talk like they're in a movie, but 
So there is a certain amount of you know, dramatic license that you have to use. But you can write too cinematically, you know, you can write too theatrically and too, too much like your characters are on stage and that can come through on the page and that can really hurt your script. Problem is a lot of people try to outwit themselves with dialogue. They, they think they gotta use verbiage or words that people don't use. They, they gotta show you how smart they are. I think we've talked about it before. It's like the drummer that overplays everything to show, look how good my chops are. And it's not about that. It's, it's, about, it's about making things sound organic. And that's a lot of things that the actors have to understand too is you know, they're acting or are they truly listening and responding with the work. There can be dialogue that's too poetic, right? Like it's so poetic that we aren't really having a conversation anymore and we aren't really pushing the story forward anymore. We're just saying nice flowery things. One of the mistakes a lot of screenwriters make is that they, all the, all the characters sound exactly alike. You should be able to, you know, block out the character name and know who's talking. Well, I like to talk a lot about contrast. So if you have two characters in the scene, it's really always more interesting if, if the characters are uh, contrasted. So if a character is speaking in a formal way, so somebody who's an academic or a professor or a doctor and he speaks um, in a formal way, make sure that the person that he's interacting with speaks in a more slangy way or you know more contracted way because that's going to make you're going to create that contrast you know just like in painting if you you want to highlight the color blue you surround it with yellow right it's opposite uh, so it's the same thing with characters um, a lot of the techniques in in the dialogue chapter in the book are about individuality how do you create individual voices because having all the characters sound the same is a very common problem with dialogue it's usually the writer's voice does this line belong to this character or or is it someone else that has to say that should say that line and the easiest one is irony you take a character um, who says uh, you look like hell okay that's a straightforward attack and says you look beautiful just flip it completely upside down and they'll be like, what do you mean? I couldn't sleep last night. You know, they'll <laughs> defend themselves because they're going to get it. Because a lot of human interaction is ironic. Speaking of dialogue, this is a total aside, but it's just a funny thing that happens to a South African in LA. It's really funny. Is this, um, so I was surfing and this guy was surfing and his board, he fell off his board and his board was, I picked his board up and I gave it to him. I was on the shore. And I said something like, oh, I see your board has got space for two fins, which is, Anyway, which is a strange sentence you wouldn't normally say, but I could see his face and his face was like, this human being is talking to me. <laughs> I think he's talking to me in English. It's definitely English and he's confident in English, but it's not American. And then I said it again. And then he was like, okay, he is speaking English and he is very <laughs> confident in it. I need to like adjust my brain to understand what he's saying. And then I spoke it again and then he was like, and he understood me. But it's really funny to see that happen here. It's just a, a total aside, but it's in terms of dialogue, you know, like, the, the miscommunication that can happen with dialogue is really funny. And then the subtleties, the subtext, it's, man, it's just, I find it really funny because like English is my home language. This is the way I speak. But when I speak it here, every time I see this look on people's face, it's classic. It's the like, this man is not from America and he's talking to me. I've never spoken to a South African before. I don't know what the space is. It's really a great look anyway. I'm sure Trevor Noah understands. Luckily for Trevor Noah, thank goodness for Trevor Noah, he's opened up the door to there South African go. accents. Yeah. Right.